You're listening to The Wild Initiative Podcast Network. Learn more and check out all the shows at thewildinitiative.com. You're listening to the Fish Untamed Podcast, where we talk all things fishing, conservation, and the outdoors. Today on the show, I'm joined by Jared Larson, Marketing Specialist at Onyx Maps. All right, welcome to episode number seven of the Fish Untamed Podcast. Today, I'm chatting with Jared Larson from Onyx Maps. Uh, Onyx is probably one of my favorite apps of all time. I use it nearly any time I go hunting, fishing, camping, really anything outside that I might need to see uh, private land boundaries or trails, uh, trail distances and elevations, anything like that. Um, I'm pulling it out all the time to kind of verify where I am and and make my next move. Uh, If you've never heard of Onyx Maps, I'd be surprised but I still meet a lot of people who have either never used it or don't know all the features it has. And uh, as much as I use Onyx, I found myself learning a whole lot talking to Jared because he shares uh, a lot of secrets that I didn't know existed uh, and also shares a lot of features that they have in the works right now that aren't released yet. So uh, if you've never heard of Onyx, this will be a really informative one for you. Uh, but even if you have used Onyx, I found that there were a lot of tidbits in here that um, I'm definitely going to be using next time I hit the water. So uh, make sure you listen to the end to hear all of those uh, secrets that Jared shares, as well as the upcoming features that are going to be released soon. So without further ado, here is my chat with Jared Larson. You have any, uh, you, well, you said your boyfriend and you didn't find any elk last weekend, huh? No, but, he, he ended up going up last night to try to make something work and he got stuck on a closed I-70 until 1230 in the morning, so. Oh, fun. <laughs> so I think his season's over. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, you guys got dumped on last night, huh? Yeah, we got, some places got 15 inches, so. Dang. Do you, do you ski? We do. So okay. we're, we're excited for that. Heck yeah. Yeah, I saw that like A Basin is already open. Yeah, so is uh, Keystone. Crazy. Do you ski too? Yeah, yep. I, nice. uh As as much as I love fall, I always am looking forward to when the snow starts to fall. It's kind of nice having, you know, when one thing ends, the next begins. So it's, it's kind of bittersweet. Other than it sounds just like you, you hunt, you ski, and you fish. So there is literally no time of the year to save any money. No, I think May is our like most down month. There's like turkey yeah. hunting, but we're not we're not really big into turkey hunting, so that's well, our only free month. You just wait. <laughs> turkey hunting is probably my favorite. Oh really? It's it's like a, an easier game of elk hunting. Yeah, you can yeah. still talk to them. I mean, I've done it a handful of times. It's just I did it out east where yeah. I knew how to do it, and out here it's like a completely different ball game, and I just yeah, have totally. not figured it out yet. Fair enough. Well, there's still time. And and I guess the the freezer rewards are less enticing when with turkey hunting. Yeah, maybe like a single a single roast and then you're done. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and it's and it's no venison backstrap. Right, that's what we yeah. had last night. Yeah, nice. So you in the office right now? I am in the office. Yep, uh, everyone's clearing out. Yeah, that's it. thanks yeah. for hanging around. Hey, I appreciate anytime. it. Uh, I you know I I went and poured myself a beer from the keg. So oh, we're perfect. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, but, thanks for coming on. I uh, I really appreciate it. I've, I was excited to hear that they had someone who uh, was interested in talking fishing. Heck yeah, yeah. There's <laughs> there's a bunch of people around this office that uh, that use the product to fish. Um, why we don't have a fishing product yet? I I wish we did. That's what I'll say. I mean, there's a there's a little bit of functionality for fishing, oh, like fishing a, specific. But there's a ton of functionality, but you know, we just don't market towards fishermen yet. Right. Um, and uh, you know. Time will tell if we if we do go down that road. Well, I definitely have some things to ask on that front, so Perfect. we can tackle that. But do um, you just want to start with uh, kind of telling me a little bit about yourself? I read your bio and uh, definitely want to hear about your time in Alaska. Yeah. Uh, so, were you guiding all of those summers or just, uh, n- just the last n- one? Nope, just the last one. So, yeah, I grew up in Wisconsin um, and, you know, certainly did a ton of fishing, uh, mostly like fishing for largemouth and, you know, pike and that thing, um, you know, just freshwater lakes. Uh, we had a cabin, um, so fished there a ton. 
And then, um, is yeah, that fly call, fishing or conventional? Yeah, I was conventional fishing at okay. that point. Um, and I mean like my dad, I like had some fly rods and one of my uncles was like super into fly fishing. And so like, we'd play around with fly rods now and again. Um, but it was, it was pretty much all gear. And then, um, my sister moved up to Alaska to go to grad school and she was living on a sailboat by herself. I think it was like her, her first full summer up there. Maybe it was her second. And she was just like, Hey Jared, you should come live on this sailboat with me for a summer. And I was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> and, and so I just like booked a one-way ticket. Uh, she was in Juneau. So I booked a one-way ticket up there and um, we just spent the summer living on the sailboat um, and she was doing school stuff and I didn't have a car. So I had to find a job I could walk to. And so I ended up working at this little coffee shop and was just a barista for the summer, um, but mostly a fishing bum. Nice. Uh, like I went up there with some fly rods. I was like determined to figure out how to fly fish. And that's all I did. I'd, I'd go make coffee in the morning and then dip out of work. And um, I mean, there's a ton of places within walking distance, you know, streams and like little outlets, um, estuaries and just catching. I mean, I caught Kings that summer. I caught tons of dollies, um, you know, pink salmon, chum salmon, everything but a coho. Uh, and I was just hooked from, from then on. Um, and then, came back to Juno the next summer for a month. And then, uh, the year after that, that's when I went up to Bristol Bay and guided on the Alagnac, um, for a summer, which was super awesome. Uh, it was, it was actually like the highest water year that they had seen in like a couple decades. Uh, our, the lodge manager at the Alagnac had been guiding on that river for, I think like 38 years or something. Wow. Um, yeah. Yeah. Scott Struznick, he, he knew the river, like the back of his hand and, um, it was, it was a super fun cruise, super fun river, uh, you know, a lot of plug in for Kings. Um, so not necessarily fl fly fishing. We were at, we were like five miles from, from salt. So like the tides actually would affect our docks. Like we had to have floating docks, like the tides would push way up. And I mean, water would rise like six to eight feet on a big tide. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So we were fishing tidewater. So it wasn't as many fly fishing clients. We'd certainly have some. Um, especially for like cohos in August, mm -hmm. um, but a lot of plug in for Kings. So like back trolling, um, and then just a lot of conventional gear for, for chums and pinks as well as fly fishing. And, and honestly, the Alagnac is kind of known as like the best river to go catch chums in, at least to my knowledge in, in Bristol Bay. Um, it's just got a lot of, a lot of sandbars. So it's super easy and like super, friendly to you know not all of the clients that go to alaska are, are super fishy people um, <laughs> and so the alagnac's a, a good river for for those types um and the chum salmon just come in hordes um and and that's kind of what our main most of july was chums and you know you're not you're not killing chums to eat them but they fight like heck uh they'll bend an eight weight like you wouldn't believe so are the ri the rivers that flow into Bristol Bay, are they, do they have different species of salmon or is it more just timing of year that determines like what's in the water at any given time? Uh, for the most part, it's like time of year, but there's certainly rivers that have far bigger returns of specific species than others. Okay. Um, so for example, like the Quijack, which is like one of the main rivers in Bristol Bay, has like the largest sockeye return in the world, I believe. Um, and like the Alagnac is the largest tributary of the Quijack. Um, so we had like, we had, the Alagnac has pretty, pretty decent sockeye returns, um, good king returns good chum returns and then pinks return they're they're the oddball so all other four species of salmon return every four years so they're you know born spend four years in the sea and then come back whereas pinks are on a two-year rotation so they're like every other year okay um and i was up there on an odd year so we didn't get pinks that year but um so how did the fishing compare between juno and uh, was that like anchorage area that you were in when you're guiding yeah, so so Bristol Bay is oh, what is it? It's like a two hour little puddle hopper flight. Um or no. No, it was a main it was a main seven thirty seven to King Salmon from Bristol Bay, and I think it was close to two hours. Okay. Um but it was very different. Very different than Juno. Juno is like y y there's a lot of fishing off the road system. Um, but otherwise you need a boat, you know, because it's it's not technically an island, but there's no roads off of Juno. And it really doesn't have like a large river nearby. It's just a lot of creeks okay. um, that go into estuaries. So, and it's a lot of hatchery fish in Juneau, to be honest with you. I mean, there's certainly some um, native returns, but like 
the kings are almost all hatchery fish in Juneau, whereas in Bristol Bay, you know, it's it's pretty untouched by man. Um, you know, all natural returns. Um, so that's the biggest difference, I think, is like a lot of the returns in southeast Alaska are hatchery fish, and there are native ones. Um, and then you know, Bristol Bay is still so pristine and awesome, and right. you know, that's that's why there's such a fight against pebble mine. Right. Is there is there much of a fishing culture in Juneau? Does, is it is it less? I mean, I assume it's less so than you know up in Bristol Bay, but is that still a big thing there? Yes, definitely. Okay. And Alaska Fly Fishing Goods is is a fly shop in Juneau, and they do an amazing job of like bringing the community together. So like they have um, like tons of nights throughout the year of like learn to fly tie, learn to like learn fly fishing. Um, so they are really good about involving the community. And I've be- definitely been to like a few of the events that they've hosted, and like. One time, like they host an annual, just like barbecue for the town, and there's like a bunch of rods you can cast at uh, this little park called Twin Lakes. And I was there, and there's like 150 people that showed up. Um, like it was a super good turnout. I was impressed. So I would say there's definitely a, a good fishing culture in Juneau. Nice. I haven't made it up there yet, but I've got a couple of buddies who Go. have been up there, and yeah, I, it's on the bucket list for sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I it's one gotten... of those that like it's totally doable for you, especially if you know somebody up there. Right. I feel like that's one of those, you know, quote unquote, exotic destinations. It's not really that hard to do like a DIY trip. Totally. Um, you, you could do like one or two days guided and then, you know, go off on your own and figure it out. But yeah, definitely want to make it up there at some point. <laughs> yep. Book a ticket and go. Because you're, you're totally right. I mean, for being like a world renowned destination, uh, Alaska is easy to get to. Yeah, for sure. So. Um, well, do you want to tell me a little bit about on X in general, you know, not necessarily specifically related to fishing, but just kind of give everyone an overview of what on X is if they're not familiar. Yeah. So, I mean, on X we make, um, well, it started out as a chip for a GPS with the most accurate land ownership information available on the market. Um, and then it's evolved into the app, you know, the on X hunt app is our flagship product at this point. And, um, I mean, download onto your phone and it completely can turn your smartphone into a standalone GPS with or without service, um, all public private land boundaries. Um, you know, it designates whether it's BLM national forest, um, Indian reservation, all color coded and like private parcels. You can tap on a parcel and get the owner's name, tax information. Um, the only thing we don't have in there is phone numbers. So, I mean, you can still look them up in the white pages real quick. Um, but overall, I mean, it's, it's a game changing tool. Uh, you know, I had it before I worked here. That was why I applied here, honestly, because I was like, yeah, this is a sweet product. I want to work there. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know how I'd hunt without it anymore, honestly. Right. And what, at what point did it go from, uh, just kind of like on X maps to on X hunt specifically so- like for hunting? Yeah, yeah. So the Onyx Maps to like just Onyx rebrand was in like the summer of 2017. Okay. Uh, and and that's when we rebranded to just be like Onyx, drop the maps, and then like our flagship product was Onyx Hunt. Um, and at the time, we actually had a Rome app, which is no longer a thing. Um, but we are expanding verticals. Like we do have an Onyx off-road app. Um, I currently. saw that. Yeah, it's only an Android right now, um, but it's coming out for iOS. Uh, should be soon. Um, so like that's you know overlanders, ATVers, you know dirt biking, you know any any off-road trail is marked on that app, um, and it's actually gaining really good traction. So. So how is that different from the because there's like a an off road ish layer at least on the on the hunt app where I can look at you know roads and yep. they usually give a description of whether you need high clearance or, or things like yeah, that. Yeah, the is that MB, different? MBUM trail layer I believe is the yeah. one you're referring to there. Um, it's I know off road is significantly more detailed like it has like opening dates, closing dates. But to be honest with you. I can't speak to that super accurately. So that's where I'm going to leave it. Fair enough. <laughs> I'm just curious. <laughs> yeah. Like um, we actually have like a whole separate functional Onyx off-road team and yeah, it's, uh, oh, interesting. It's, it's progressing quickly. Uh, do you happen to know what the demographics of your um, like user base is? Like, are they mostly hunters or do you have a lot of people who are just like, Hey, I like to hike and you know, I still want to stay off private property and I'm just gonna get this app for my, you know, non-hunting or fishing totally. activities. Uh, as a general scope, like I don't know any numbers, um, but just from like surveys that I know I've done and I've seen data from, um, it's majority is, is hunters just because again, that's where we are marketing towards. Mm-hmm. 
Um, but we always get people back in those surveys saying, I only use this app for hiking and camping. Oh, I'm a real estate agent. Oh, I'm a forester. Um, certainly a bunch of people replied that they use it for fishing. Um, so, I mean, it has so many use cases. Uh, and actually there's like some weird le legalities, like we can't market to real estate um, actually in the current um, situation we're in, which I don't know the, all the laws intertwined with that, but there are some interesting caveats like that. Huh, I was not aware of that, but yeah. I've definitely recommended it to people who I know don't hunt. And I'm just like, you know, if you, if you're just trying to hike and, you know, go way far back and find places to access, like this is the, this is the best thing you can, can totally get yourself. Y even if you're just like looking for camping spots or like a weekend hiking trail, it, it's, it's crazy how much I use the app just in everyday life. Right. And I can attest to the fact that it does really turn your phone into the only thing you need. The only thing I'm ever hesitant about is, you know, making sure I've got an extra battery backup battery life. or yeah. like worry that I'm going to drop my phone in the river or something. But, <laughs> like there's a little part of me that wants to carry a backup GPS, but you know, I did for a little bit and have mm -hmm. like more than one uh, yep. piece of equipment. And I find myself just going straight back to the app every time. So I, it's all I carry now. And I just got to hope for the best in terms of uh, not breaking my phone or something. That's um, awesome. But yeah, it's it's super functional, the the offline mode. Do you want to talk about the offline mode real quick? Absolutely. Just... Okay. So so like the amount of people that are unaware that you can save maps is pretty crazy. Of people that are even paying for the app, like they don't realize that that there's that off grid, um, you know, tab in the toolbar down there and, and, you know, it just never occurs to them. So I yeah, actually met four people last weekend who didn't, who they had it and they were like, yeah. Onyx doesn't work very well here. And I was like, well, did you save your map? And they're like, what are you talking mm -hmm. about? And I was yep. like, how, how have you been paying for this and not noticed yeah. that like one of the five main options at the bottom of the screen is totally. offline. Like we have so many comments on like Facebook and Instagram and, and people reaching out to our customer support team that have the same exact experience they're like well, i like why did i buy this and it's like well because you can save maps you just don't you just haven't yet right uh but yeah the ability to to i mean you obviously just go into off grid hit save new map pick the area overlay you know how much resolution you want whether you want a really tight five square mile map 10 square mile or the the broad 150 and what i typically do is i save a broad 150 into the general area i'm going and then I save, you know, 10 mile maps inside of that, just in case, you know, the spot I thought I was going to go to is full of trucks or turned out to be a flop or, or whatever. Um, you know, if you have that 150 saved around it, at least you can navigate. Right. I've done the exact same thing. I've actually saved like basically the whole state of Colorado under the mm -hmm. 150 miles wide uh, yep. option. That way, wherever I am, I know I'll be able to at least view, you know, where I am on a map. And then when I'm going somewhere specific, then I'll save the five or 10 miles wide. But that way I know that I'll have something, you know, anywhere I go. That is, is definitely the play to make. Super handy. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what are some of the – I know it's not really meant to be fishing specific, but you do have a couple features that are related to fishing, like uh, River Stage and mm -hmm. um, Great Lakes and stuff like that. Do you want to go over a couple of those? Totally. And I actually, uh, you know, I have use cases for pretty much everything in that app for fishing, to be honest with you. All right. Well, I'll hear you know, <laughs> there's, there's uh, a lot of the folks in the office here, you know, I fish pretty hard and hunt and, you know, they often ask like, well, if you only could fish or only could hunt, what would you do? And my answer is usually fish, you know, you can do it anywhere and you can and do it all around. year. Yep. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, so like the river stage forecast and great lakes bathymetry, that's data that we pull in from NOAA. Okay. Um, that so was not one of my other questions where yep, you get not, it. not our own data. Um, and the river stage forecast, if you turn that layer on under the, the water tab of your layer library, um, you can actually go into layer settings and either get the current river stage or the 48 hour forecast. If you just change that in the layer settings. Um, so again, that's all coming from NOAA, obviously super helpful for fishing, knowing, you know, what the river stage is, whether it's going to be high water, tough waiting or, or low water, you know, depending on what, you know, help predict what hatches might be, um, that type of thing, but really, you know, most helpful for like floating, uh, in my opinion anyway, and then great lakes bathymetry, you know, we don't have a ton of detail on that bathymetry data we're getting from NOAA. Um, and I can't really speak to using it. I haven't been to the great lakes in some time. Um, <laughs> but, but I know, I do know some buddies that, that certainly have told me it's been useful. I actually grew up in Wisconsin, as I said, haven't been back in a while. Um, but yeah, we definitely have those two layers talked about off grid, which, you know, if you're out West hiking up trailheads into rivers or Alpine lakes, the off grid mode is definitely going to play a factor, um, 
fishing in that way. And then the line distance tool, like if I'm floating rivers around here, I'll use the line distance tool and, you know, you can make as many segments as you want. So you can just follow the contours of the river with the line distance tool. That way you can kind of like map out, oh, this float's going to be seven miles. This float's going to be 13 miles. That way you can kind of time it out to, to float a, you know, an appropriate section for how much time you have that day or whatever. Um, tracker, I use the tracker also when I'm floating, uh, especially like year over year you start to you always think you're gonna remember like how fast you float with certain flows mm -hmm. but I never actually do um and so like my favorite floats I have like a bunch of different tracks on them with like and you know it saves the date that you made that track so I just like look oh you know I floated this on January 13th it took me four hours or January July 13th took me four hours and then I can kind of you know tell that way how long a float might take um you know waypoints for the obvious stuff if you you know catch a bunch of fish in a hole drop a waypoint um you know that type of thing uh and then the one thing i always really do is like if i'm going on a fishing trip and i'm going to a river specifically i'll always go on web map and just scour that that river on web map just aerial imagery you know looking for big boulders that are going to create holes you know deep bends that are going to have deep banks um you know big pools to fish uh I, i've really become kind of obsessed with bull trout uh in the last couple of years um and you can't legally target them in the most waters in montana so i'm usually going over to idaho and fishing their okay. bull trout um and, you know, bull trout are notorious for just wanting deep, cold pools. Um, and, and, and so I've been pretty successful at just like picking those pools out with the aerial imagery on web map, dropping waypoints there, and then boots on the ground show up. And usually it's pretty solid um, as far as, you know, what I thought I was getting into. Um, and I mean, obviously rec points sounds like you've used those for, you know, like camp spots and stuff, but like mm -hmm. all registered boat ramps are there as rec points, uh, fishing access sites. Um, so like, you know, an easy one to just find a place to go fish for the day. Um, if you're got a boat or even if you don't got a boat, um, and then obviously trails, you know, it always helps mm -hmm. to have a nice hiking trail that goes along the river rather than bushwhacking. So. Yeah, and it, it seems like most of the features that you're using and that I use are not really fishing specific, but they just really help you. And I'd never thought of the um, like tracking a float to see how yeah. long it took you because I don't I don't really do much floating. I'm almost sure. almost always waiting. Uh, and so I've tracked myself in other situations, usually in hunting situations. But um, that's a really interesting point that you could see how long it took you to go a certain distance. Yeah. Um, in a, on a float, so. So what are you, what what are some of your most used features when you're out fishing? I'd say my well my most used is probably either trails or um, private land, just because sure. uh, I, we'll get around to it. But the stream <laughs> access laws here are really yeah. awful, yeah. so it's not as simple as like get into the water and stay in the water. It is mm -hmm. like you need to be on top of it the entire time you're fishing, and some people are really good about marking it and other people are not. So yep. a, it's a lot of time spent um, planning where I'm going to go, you know, spot to spot, even just along a road being like, okay, I'll park here, fish, you know, this section, this is a long enough section of public that it's worth going to um, that I'll drive here. So I'd say definitely the, uh, the public private boundaries are, are probably the main reason I have Onyx, honestly, right just on. because it's so important in this state. Yeah, yeah, Colorado's water access is not nearly as friendly as Montana's. No, and it's it's so surprising considering, I mean, Colorado makes so much money off of people coming here to recreate, not just for fishing, but, you know, any floating, yeah, yeah, I mean, rafting, hunting, fishing, just the outdoors in general. I'm, I'm really surprised that they haven't uh, kind of be, gotten a little more progressive on that on that end. And I mean, you guys are far from alone as far as Western states that have, you know, similar tough access laws as for, for, for fisher, for fishing. So we, I guess we can just get into that. Um, the document you sent over to me regarding stream access, is that something that you whipped up or did you get that from somewhere else? No. So actually, um, Onyx has this portal, if you will, called Hunt Central. And, and basically it, it uh, has data from each state, um, with, with all tag prices, when their season dates are, overview of, you know, like what the state's known for as far as hunting abilities or, you know, hunting, you know, like, for example, like 
Montana is known for great big game hunting and, you know, like excellent elk hunting, for instance, with over the counter tags. Um, but we've wanted to, for a little while now, expand that and put like water access laws and some, you know, like, like corner crossing is illegal in Montana, but legal in other states. So we've wanted to like dive into these other little nuances of many states and these laws that Onyx will help you navigate and water access is being one of them. And um, in fact, we have a, an access department led by our founder, Eric Siegfried. Um, and he actually asked me, you know, knowing that I fish a bunch um, to put together just like some summaries of stream access for the, for the Western states, the same states we did the landlocked report for. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what the doc I sent to you over is. And, you know, thankfully backcountry hunters and anglers has already done a lot of that work. So um, they actually have a, like a complete guide of, a, you know, many of those states set up and whether whether you can float through private lands or get out of your boat if the land under the water is private or if you can even anchor so I, I that's that's where all of that research stemmed from is is to hopefully make all of this more public knowledge um that way you know folks are better informed and because you know i'm sure every year in colorado i'm sure there's tons of people that get trespassing tickets because they mm -hmm. end up fishing over private riverbed right especially if you're coming from a state where it's a lot more lenient um in, in montana it's that you can walk up to the high water mark right yep yeah yep. and so i and that seems totally logical you know just like yeah. stay in the river yeah you know, stay yep. in the river don't come up onto my actual land and totally and, and, and it's high water mark so high water you know is typically in may or june which you know by the time august rolls around and you know the best fishing is you have usually the close to 20 yards of dry riverbank that you can walk because high mm -hmm. water mark is so much higher. So it's like, it's convenient as a fisherman. You don't have to constantly be in the water. Uh, you know, especially like walking back upstream, you know, that's never all that fun when you have to stay in the water. So, right. And I think, I think, I don't know if this is Montana or a different state I'm thinking of. I know there's some that have, um, some gray areas in terms of whether you can use a river to access public land. If you didn't, if you didn't, uh, I'm trying to think of how it's how it goes do you know what i'm talking about yeah i know what you're talking about and montana is an interesting one so like you can't legally like if i wanted to go chase elk like there's there's quite a few landlocked parcels just down the bitter route just south of missoula here that um oh, do you want to explain what landlocked parcels are real quick yeah so like a landlocked parcel of public land is is, is just a parcel of public land that's not open to the public. There's no road access that touches it, no easement. It's all surrounded by private. And so, you know, it's, it's your lands and my lands that we can't get to, um, be, because there's no access to them. So really just um, the private landowners that border that, that area can get to it. And they they often look like checkerboards kind of totally. where, where you could, if it were legal, step from one corner of public into another corner of public, but yep. you can't. Cause you can't corner cross. Yeah. Right. So that, yep. that specifically is illegal. Um, and so there's a lot of this land out there that is just inaccessible, even though if you could somehow get in there, it would be legal for you to be there. You just yeah. can't get to it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, to, to hop back to what we were talking about, like in Montana, you can't legally like just walk a river to public lands with a rifle on your back and go hunt it if that water is throwing through private land. Um, but if you float it or you bring a fishing rod or you are partaking in some activity that, you know, relates to that water access, and then you also have a rifle with you and then you get to that public land and go hunting, that is apparently a legal loophole. So like that is it, the one I was talking it, about. And yeah. Access, yeah. How, I don't know how they, I don't know if you'll know either, but just to chat about it yeah how can they defend that like if, if so basically you could walk up it legally without a rifle and then be on the public land but you can't walk up it be on that land and then go hunting which is legal on that land yeah so our founder eric siegfried he's 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 very interested in that nuance of the law and so like he had talked to some lawyers and had some lawyers write up some documents you know surrounding that um, and all the lawyers pointed in the direction of that you'd, you'd have a pretty good case um, that you'd likely win in court. It, it was their opinion. Um, but I'm not going to test it. Yeah, no, for sure. And I've heard people say, like, just carry a rod with you. Like, if, even if you're not going to go fishing, just and, bring a rod along and, yep. you know, take a cast. Yep. And, and the weirdest part is, is, is you can do it to waterfall hunt. So, like, I can do that same thing to waterfall hunt, but I can't. 
because it's a game. water related activity uh, i guess yeah and, and, and do you happen to know if it's rifle specific like could you carry a shotgun up there uh i, I don't I, if you are intending to hunt big game I don't think it is legal. That is just such an odd like I that what your intentions are seems like a very gray area. And yeah. these stream access laws in general seem like a gray area. Like I looking at the document you sent over and just so everyone knows this document is basically it just lists each state with uh with some of the definitions and and laws pertaining to stream access. And yep. it seems like a lot of time things just aren't well defined or there is no definition um you know like navigability things like that. Well, yeah, and it sounds uh, – I'm going to go pull one directly out of Washington here because it's so obscure. Um, but like the – so so one of the questions that we wanted to answer um, for this is what is the definition of navigability in this state? So this is Washington, and this is the definition. A stream must be able to float a bolt of shingles to be considered navigable. While a bolt of shingles isn't large, the state courts have expressly stated that streams capable of passage by a canoe or kayak are not necessarily navigable. The state owns the bed of all navigable waters. So, like, who even knows what a bolt of shingles <laughs> is? Very pertinent to modern day society. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's like, you know, it seems like a lot of these laws were made up, you know, way back when. And, and you know, they've never been revisited unsurprisingly um but yeah yeah it's pretty obscure and do you know what it takes to have these laws revisited i know oh. that these that's probably not your area of expertise but it's just so interesting that you'd think that this would be a large enough issue that affects enough people that the states would want to clear these things up and you just give a solid definition so there's no more you know stepping around trying to figure out what's going on as you said, you know, like like Colorado and a lot of these Western states, they draw so many people into, you know, go whitewater rafting, come fishing, you know, just general recreation that oftentimes happens in the rivers. And, and many of these laws are just so gray that, yeah, I, I, I don't know what it takes to get them changed, but, uh, you know, I, I'd have to imagine it's Supreme Court. And, um, yeah, that's a lot of legal battle. Yeah, for sure. It's. It's just it's it's almost impressive how how out of date some of these these things are. I mean, I think Colorado didn't have a clear definition of navigability. Um, some of these just don't have an answer. Like no one's ever bothered to to answer it. Like some yep. of the I saw some of the bridge. Like can you can you access a river from a bridge? Yep. That you know that's a public roadway, mm-hmm. um, and there's just like never been a definition. So you know. I feel like if you're out there, it's basically you're trying to deal with whoever happens to catch you doing it and how they interpret it. That's just it. That's what I was going to say is like, you know, it all just depends which uh, game warden you get that day. Yeah. And it's actually, this is just a side tangent, but we had um, recently we were going small game hunting out here and there's a uh, there's a law in Colorado that you can't um, squirrel hunt with a dog during any regular big game season. Oh, and interesting. we're going to go squirrel hunting and we have a dog who's like not a hunting dog. She's just mm-hmm. she's just a dog. She has no idea why we're out there. But <laughs> we, we wanted to go on a squirrel hunt and have her just tag along. You know, she's not assisting in the hunt at all. Yeah. And we had called um, Colorado Parks and Wildlife to ask if this is OK. Like as long as she's not participating in the hunt and not assisting us in any way, could she be there? And the the uh, person on the other end of the line didn't even know that was a law. And. Um, couldn't really give us a clear answer and we're like so if if we do this um, yeah. and someone is like someone comes across us it, it almost seems like it's just up to the discretion of the mood of the person on that day and that just doesn't feel like how a law should operate you know and, and to be honest with you like we've experienced because like we've called Montana FWP about that law we were just talking about like walking into big game uh-huh. um, and, and it just depends on, on who you talk to that day. Sometimes they're like, oh, yeah, you'd be fine. Oh, nope, you'd get a ticket. Like, I, it's all interpretation. It's all that person that day that comes across you. It, it's, right. it's crazy. Which makes you want to err on the side of caution every time, totally. which, you know, is, is the safer way to go. But also, if I have a right to do something, I want to be able to do that and not worry about getting a ticket if I'm doing something that's totally legal. So, yeah, that's that's crazy. Have, has Onyx, um, correct me if I'm wrong here. You guys worked, I guess, was it in partnership with backcountry hunters and anglers to kind of um, assess the landlocked land that's out there and kind of give a, a number to it? Is that correct? So, so it was actually TRCP. Oh, is uh, it? Okay. 
Yep, yep. We worked with CRCP with all the landlock stuff. And we actually, like, as I kind of previously mentioned it, we built an internal access team that's actually growing pretty quickly um, that, you know, we had folks from our GIS team, you know, collecting all of that data, trying to, you know, figure out how many acres of, and we did two separate access reports. We did the federal one and then the state one. So like federal lands and state lands. Mm. Um, so like tons of man hours into, you know, finding each landlocked parcel, um, you know, marking down the acreage where it is, uh, you know, to compile all of those mind boggling stats, of millions and millions of acres that are landlocked throughout the West. Um, and, and yeah, so now we have this access team built that our, you know, founder Eric is, is in, you know, heading up and, um, you know, we're hoping to get some, some budget for that to help unlock these, these public lands that, uh, that we should be able to access. Um, in fact, like last year we did a, a pretty cool campaign with Randy Newberg and loophole optics, um, where, uh, I'm actually wearing the t-shirt under the sweatshirt right now, but it's, uh, um, Marcus, the public lands llama. So, oh yeah, I have seen him. <laughs> yeah, Randy Newberg like hunted with you know this this pack of llamas, herd of llamas, whatever you want to call them, um, and like tried you know was helping promote public lands and the sales of these t-shirts that we made. Um, we donated all the funds back um, to help open up um, some access. And Loophole just did a blog on their site about it um, that we're working with them um, to to open up some of these these access projects. So are you guys doing much of the actual kind of advocacy work for that? Or is uh, is that more on them and your job is kind of to quantify all the land? Or are you actually um, actively, you know, talking to decision makers about these lands and how to unlock them? Um, both, for sure. So okay. so Eric, Eric goes to um, quite a few conferences um, where he, he is a speaker um, to to you know, help unlock these public lands. I can't speak to the exact um, of nature of that and, and sure. how we're involved with helping unlock these, but uh, I know we've put dollars towards it and, and that uh, that it's an ongoing battle for sure. I know this is probably a little different just because this isn't really about quantifying, but do you think that there would be any um, possibility down the road of doing like a similar sort of project with stream access um, like I said, it's not, you know, it's, it's a little different because it, you don't really need to quantify the stream access, but, mm -hmm. um, do you happen to know if there's any kind of push being made either from TRCP or backcountry hunters and anglers, um, in partnership with you guys at all to talk about stream access laws and kind of get some of those <laughs> fixed? Currently there's not, okay. um, but you know, like, like this, that doc I sent you was kind of the beginning of all this stream access stuff. And, you know, I mean our busy season is, you know, mid August and through December is, mm -hmm. you know, when, when we're all cranking on, on hunts. Cause you know, that the time is now, but this off season, I definitely anticipate some of this stream access stuff and, and, uh, more of this landlock project to, to make its way into hopefully opening up more access to public lands. And I would sure think that we'll publish some of this stream access stuff on Hunt Central and, and start to help raise awareness on, on the poor stream access because it is something that Eric really wants to um, um, push because, you know, as, as we've talked about multiple times now, tons of people are using these waters to not only fish but, but hunt and recreate, and, and we can't do so, especially down in Colorado and Utah and Arizona. I mean, there's a lot of states with some – like Arizona, you can't even legally th float through private lands. That's insane. Like even if you're not touching the bottom? Yeah. Just that they own the water? Yeah. That is crazy. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you uh, – do you happen to know – well, actually, I want to go back to something you just said that, that kind of sparked something in my mind. Um, like you said, Onyx isn't specifically a, a fishing app. It's you know definitely mostly hunting-related. Yep. But you know these, these stream access laws aren't specific to fishing because if – I mean, if you're using the stream access to just be on the water, then sure. But a lot of the time, it could just be to access areas, you know? Yep. Um, and – I feel like that's a uh, something that just gets overlooked versus something like the landlocked land or just straight up, you know, public versus private is uh, these these laws can affect more than just anglers. You know, anyone who's trying to get totally. into any sort of public land um, or just be on the water. You know, there's plenty of people that that hunt near water and need to camp near water and want to be able to, you know, access it. 
and, and quite frankly, I bet that you and I are the vast minority of, of folks that use these waters and actually know the ins and outs of the laws. Like the fact that you can't like drop an anchor in Utah when you're above private stream bed, like I'm sure that law gets broken all the time, you mm-hmm. know, unless, unless they have on X or how would they ever know, you know? Right. Cause I mean, it's not like it's posted across the river or anything. It's just like, well, this is a good hole. I'm going to drop anchor here. And you mean to tell me that the, the vast majority of people don't know what a bolt of shingles is? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but that's so true though, because you know, I know I know the laws, at least for Colorado, I don't know the laws for all the other states unless I yep. go fish them. But growing up in Pennsylvania, I did not know what the stream access laws were. And as a kid, I just kind of did whatever I wanted. And yeah. granted, I was a kid, so I probably wouldn't have faced major repercussions <laughs> if someone had found me walking on their shoreline. Like, no one's probably going to care. But, yeah. um, you know, it never even occurred to me that I could be on someone else's land. Um, and I've since gone back and, like, looked at, at some of the Pennsylvania laws and been like, oh, yeah, I definitely broke all of these laws like I would just I'd beach my kayak on an island you know in the middle of a river and be like I can be here you know there's no house on here and you know it didn't even occur to me that someone owns that land and I probably can't be there so nice so Pennsylvania is where you got your start fishing yeah that's where I grew up okay so kind of like you I I grew up spin fishing too and um, came out here to take up fly fishing heck yeah so very similar upbringing um yeah Oh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, yeah, it's improved. It's improved vastly. The mountains and rivers make life far better. They do. Do you know if Onyx has any plans to um, put in some fish-specific data that's similar to some of the um, hunting-specific data? So just so people know if they don't have Onyx, there's there's like layers you can um, put over the map. So that's things like private public land. Um, it has things like elk overall range and, you know, elk migration quarters and things like that for all kinds of different species. Um, do you know if there would be any plans in the future to include things like which species of fish are found in different areas or um, things like that, like even fish migration patterns about like when they're going to be in the area and things like that? Yeah. So, you know, right now, uh, you know, as I said, off-road recently came out. I think that was launched in April. Um, and, and we are definitely exploring the options of new verticals. Um, currently, I, I don't know what the next vertical that we might explore would be. Uh, but I'm, I'm hoping and I'm, I'm hoping there will be a, a fish product um, sooner than later. And if, if that were to come to fruition, there's no question that we would definitely have a lot of layers, you know, denoting species in each watershed, um, you know, among other things, you know, I would even like to see like prominent hatches on each piece of water. Mm-hmm. And, you know, obviously all this is a lot of data collection and, and could be some time down the road, but um, it would not surprise me. I mean, ideally the data would already exist via yes. you know each state and a lot of it does parks and wildlife yeah yeah, yeah. i know uh, like colorado has an app that has they have two separate apps one for um like fish fish species locations like you sure. can select different rivers and see what lives in there and they have a separate one for hatches it's a lot more generic um yep. but you can you know choose what time you're going to go fishing and it'll say you know what's hatching that time of year it, it'll at least give you something to go spend some money at a fly shop right. like cat, caddis flies or mayflies or whatever right it'll make you more confident if nothing yep. else yep. but you know ideally uh a lot of that data would already exist via you know this the individual states um i guess the hard part might be the fact that there's not a consistent system of you know state to state what each state's recording um well and, and there's not for hunt either you know some states are awesome and provide us amazing data some states you know ask us not to publish their data oh really uh, so, yeah yeah totally um so but what's so the it's benefit all, of that um well so like for instance the the one that comes to mind is um forgive me, I'm trying to think of the a- actual program, but like, so Idaho has access. Yes. Montana has block management, which are private lands that the state pays the landowners to open them up to public hunting. Okay. Um, okay. We have so, something like that too. Yeah. Yeah. And Wyoming has that. Uh, I'm really blanking on the name of the program, but, but basically they asked us to remove the layer um, just because they didn't want that data in the app because it changes so often. And in like Wyoming, um, I believe like some of the parcels were only open for like weeks at a time. 
And, um, you know, to make sure we were keeping that all up to date, it was like, it was, it was very difficult for Wyoming to basically trust that they could get us the data in time for closures of certain parcels that they just didn't want that data in the app. Mm. Um, so like, so like instances like that where they, they don't want some data in the app, but, um, yeah, I mean, that's where we get a lot of our data is, is from, you know, local government entities. And how often is your data updated? Um, like anything from private land, I guess mostly private land parcels. Yep. Like I've noticed that our house, we got it last July and it still says the previous owner lives here, which is sure. not a big deal. It's still private. But um, how often do those do those pieces of information get updated? Yeah. So we actually try to update each state once per year. Um, okay. We have a ded- dedicated GIS team of, you know, there's probably... 30 or so folks on the GIS team that are um, working on those types of things. But we just recently started an initiative to um, basically streamline the updating of that data. So hopefully it will be significantly more often than that in the not too distant future. Very cool. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's, it's good to know um, the kind of the updated data, not just for like, like I said, it, it still shows that this is private land. It just doesn't show that we live here. Yep. Um, yep. Do you think that uh, at some point there will be thing, the more information like phone numbers? Or is that data that you can't ever access? So phone numbers have become really hard. Um, like we used to have phone numbers in the app. Um, and then actually we, we got tons of requests from landowners ask, like requesting their phone numbers be pulled from the app. I couldn't um, see that because, you know, they were contacted and they're like, well, where did you get my number? Or, you know, whatever. Right. And it all came back to us. And so we actually pulled phone numbers from the app back in 2014 or 2015, um, pretty early on in the app. And uh, and just since haven't re-added them, because quite frankly, if you want to try to phone, find a phone number, white pages is pretty easy. Right. And these days, there's just not that many people have that have landlines anymore. So you know, it, it's hard to find a phone number a lot of times. Yeah. And I guess at that point, uh, assuming you're in the area, you could just, you know, drive up to the person's house and, and knock on their door, which is, yep. the, you know, the send, more old school way of doing send it. Send a but. letter or, you know, there, there's all sorts of ways to get access. And, um, you know, I, that's, that's how I honestly started using the app. It was snow goose hunting when I was in college and, you know, you'd find a feed of snow geese and it'd be like, all right, we got to figure out who owns this parcel. And there is not a house anywhere around. Yeah. So do you, are there any, and maybe you might not be able to share this, but like, are there any other, um, feature changes, not, not fishing specific, but just to the app that, uh, you know, are unfolding. Like I know, um, you guys add features pretty frequently. Yep. Um, recently you've added things like weather for different areas. So you can see what the temperature and like wind are doing in any given area, Totally um, changed, uh, waypoints to have different colors and things like that. I know one of the features I've I've put in requests for is being able to um, put your waypoints in folders to be able to like turn yep. folders on and off instead of individual yep. waypoints. Um, do you have any features that you could talk about that you know of coming out anytime soon? Absolutely. So yeah, the biggest one that we just released, like that was last released was um, the ability to share all markups now. So like previously you only could share waypoints mm-hmm. and it would, the waypoint would come on to whoever you shared it with map, but it wouldn't carry over like notes and the name of it and all that stuff. So now you can share any markup, whether it's a track, a shape, uh, a waypoint, and it will carry all notes and names, the same color, everything. Mm-hmm. Um, Photo waypoints was actually just released. We haven't put a communication out on it yet, oh, okay. uh, but you can now attach photos to any waypoint. Oh, that's awesome. Um, yep. So like super useful for like trail cams and, and what have you, or when you're fishing, if you, you know, catch a bunch of cuts in a hole, throw a photo in there and that way you'll know. Um, so that's forthcoming. And then, so right now we have weather and all of our weather stations are, are at airports right now. Um, and we are upping that data with, uh, I don't know the exact number, but a plethora of new weather locations to get it more localized to individuals' locations, because obviously an airport typically isn't that close to, to what you're doing, where right. you might be in the mountains. So um, we're adding a ton of weather stations um, here in the near future. Folders, like you've talked about, is definitely something that's on the roadmap. Um, you know, I, I know 3D imagery is on the roadmap. I can't 
point to exactly when, um, but we are constantly adding features. Um, in fact, like throughout the fall, I'd say every couple of weeks, there's there's something new, whether that's a dozen new icons for waypoints or or what have you. But um, photo waypoints and and new weather stations are the, are the big two that should be here soon. Well, that's photo good. waypoints is in there. That's cool. I had I had wondered where you got your weather information because I've I've noticed that um, a lot of you know larger towns have it, but yep. then smaller towns wouldn't. And I was like, yep. I'm not sure if it's just a certain size of town that they're able to get it from. But that makes a lot of sense that mm-hmm. it's airports. But like you said, most of the time, you know, if you're off grid, <laughs> you're not <laughs> next to an airport. So well, and let me tell you one of my favorite secrets about the app. So uh, it, it's. It's crazy. Actually, a lot of people in the office don't even know that it exists. But if you have your rec points layer on, so um, in the trails and rec layer in the layer library, there's a rec point layer. If you turn that on, so then you'll have all these little brown squares, whether it's a campground, a boat ramp, a fishing access, a hiking trail. If you tap on those rec point layers and you scroll down through all of the information that the pop up gives you, there's a weather option through dark sky, which dark sky weather is actually like, I think it's a couple dollars a month paid app on the app store. Um, but these rec points are embedded with dark skies weather. Uh, and I had that one like right near my elk spot at close to 9,000 feet. And it gave me awesome weather all September. Like it was spot on. And so like, oh. that's honestly the weather that I go to every single time is like, I go find the nearest rec point, tap on it, scroll down, find weather. And that's, that's the weather I'm basing off of. That's a huge tip. I did not know that was a thing. And, um, I have not really used that layer because I, most of the time I I'm fishing somewhere that I know of and I don't need like sure. an access point or anything. Um, but now I'm going to have to add that layer now because that's really useful because well, here's, Here's another one I'll give you. That's all right, yeah. Cool. Share all your uh, secret tips for using yeah. the app. Yeah. So, so if like let's say you were way up a mountain road when you're looking on your app, determining where you're gonna go, and you're like, all right, I found my spot. That's where I want to park my car. So, if you t- query that spot on the app, you know it, it pulls up that location, tells you public lands, whatever, whatever. Mm-hmm. Right at the top of that white pop up. It, it's going to tell you the coordinates of that mm-hmm. pop-up. So if you tap those coordinates, there's a copy option. And if you copy those coordinates, go into your Google Maps and paste it, it's going to – Google Maps will take you right there. So, like, that's been a feature that's requested a lot is that we have Google Maps integration. And granted, this is an imperfect workaround, mm-hmm. but it, but it's a great way to, to get directions to an obscure location. That is a, a good tip because I have – I have um had that issue where I'm, I'm just trying to compare because like you said, you don't have the, uh, the 3d. So, um, again, for anyone who has not used on X, there's a, a topo layer, a hybrid layer and a satellite. And the hybrid is just satellite with topo lines drawn on top, mm-hmm. but you can't do, um, like what you can in Google maps where you can like angle the, the land down and, and view things in 3d. So a lot of times if, if I'm trying to look at something in 3d, I need to basically turn on satellite view on on x and then turn on google maps and basically like find a find a landmark and compare to, to find yeah. my spot so it sounds yeah. like you can just copy the coordinates Co- straight copy from the, the coordinates app. and google maps will bring you right to it um and and what we refer to as on x and driving then you don't have to do so much on x and driving mm-hmm. <laughs> for sure <laughs> do you do you know if that would be a uh, a feature at any point um being able it- to navigate it, it's something that we have definitely looked into extensively, and and again, it's it's on the roadmap. That sounds like a big one, probably yeah. one of the larger features. Yeah, it's it's requested so often because you know you you have a, a waypoint that a buddy sent you or or some spot that you've never been to, and you know a way a waypoint on the app it gets you there. It's just maybe not the most seamless way to get you there. Yeah, and it does have. Uh, like kind of a quote unquote navigate option where um, it's not going to navigate you on roads, but if you put a, a, I'm assuming that most people are not using on X when they're like in, in the city or whatever, anyway, yeah, they're yeah, out in the middle yeah. of nowhere where they're on trails and it won't obviously navigate you on the trails, but if you put a waypoint down and yeah, tap, like take me to waypoint or I'm not sure what the, go to. Exact, yeah, go to, um, yep. it'll, it'll point you in the right direction and then tell you how far it is to that waypoint. Um, unfortunately that could be right up over the top of a mountain, you know, the yeah, distance, I mean, it's, but... it's, ex- it's exactly the same function as like a Garmin GPS is go right. to it. It gives you distance as the crow flies and gives you a, a bearing on what direction you got ahead. And this, this is probably something I should have checked because, um, 
for all I know, I'm just using it wrong. Is there a compass function in Onyx? Not not just that when you're looking at the map, it shows which way is north, but that you can look at it yep. and have a live compass? Totally. So if, if you're looking at the app, um, you have the three dots on the bottom right-hand corner. So the top one is going to be sat, topo, or hybrid with your base map. Mm -hmm. the, middle, the middle one is when it's gray, it just looks like a crosshairs. Um, and if you tap the crosshairs once, it illuminates orange and brings you to your current location. If you tap it twice, it, that icon turns into a circle with like the GPS triangle in the middle of it. And then that will turn basically a site cone on with your current location. And you can sit there and spin around and that site cone will be in the direction that you're facing. Um, that way you have a bearing on which direction you're going. Um, and then anytime you're in what we call compass mode, there will be a compass at the top right of, of the map there. So that way, not only you have your bearing, but you also have the direction that you're facing. Yeah, I might need to use that function because um, <laughs> I, I, I often switch between on next and my phone's compass. <laughs> Sure. Uh, just I'll look at on X and be like, okay, my waypoint is you know due east of me. But then I've got to pull out the compass and and turn east and everything, and, and then keep switching back and forth. Um, does it pull from the phone's compass, or does it yep. is it its own standalone compass? It pulls from the phone's compass, um, which actually like smartphone compasses are are getting more and more and more accurate. Um, and the latest blurb that I'd read is that some of the newest smartphones are like accurate to within three feet. Oh wow. Yep. That's nice. I, I use mine and I'm in an area that I know well enough and there's there's service and and, you know, it's, it's not a huge area and I'm not too worried about getting lost because I've been there a bunch of times and I've got sure. service. But I tend to use my phone's compass for that reason, because I'm like, I'm not I'm not that worried about getting lost. I'm just using this to help me navigate around. But I do yeah. always carry an extra compass on me just in case that one is is faulty. But it's good to Old hear that. It's yeah, it's good to hear that that is pretty, pretty accurate. Yeah. And I found that but via using the app and the compass that it, it usually ends up taking me in the right direction. Um, well, gl glad to hear you haven't <laughs> got lost yet. Yeah, not yet. Well, uh, is there anything else that you would like to chat about in terms of the app? Anything um, people might want to know or anything related to fishing or just in general? I think I think we covered the app pretty dang well. Um, you know, we've talked, talked to a lot of it, um, and, and especially as far as fishing. I mean... As, as we talked about earlier, there's a ton of use cases for it. Um, so I, I think we're pretty well covered. I guess I have, I have one last question. Yeah. Um, if you do come out with uh, more of a fishing-specific vertical, would that be a standalone app, kind of like the off-road? Or would that be um, a layer or a, a set of layers that is added into the existing app? No, it would definitely be a standalone app, and that's what we're we're more exploring with these new verticals. Is um, you know, and, and it's a lot of market research to see how many folks you know currently use phishing apps, and and what what parts of the current because there's so many phishing apps out there currently. Mm -hmm. um, but to be honest with you, like none of them really do all of the functionality that Onyx does. I would catered agree. for fishing a lot of them are more like for the social aspect of like showing people what you caught where you know like what what you were using yeah. um you know that type of thing um so so i think there's there's a market for it um i just don't think that we've dove into it deep enough to to be there yet right i definitely agree i think there's a lot of fishing apps and some of them are map related but it's usually like mm -hmm. i i caught this fish right here and i can tag my location it's yeah. not so much to be used while you're fishing. It's to and, be used after then, you're done. Like, who, who's trying to tell the world where they <laughs> caught that know. fish? Like, not me. Uh, it's, a lot of it I've noticed is, like, in, in cities where it's like, yeah. I went to this city pond. I really don't care if someone knows I caught a bass out of my local Fair. pond. But, but it's, it's definitely a lot more of, like, after you're done fishing, you, you go into the app and you do things with it, not to be pulled out while you're actually on the water. So I think yep. there'd definitely be a big market. And like I said, I, I think a lot of people – who fish don't know about on next just because it's not marketed to them. Yep. Even though it's like I said, it, I use it more for fishing than I do for hunting probably because I, I fish more than I, hunt, but, <laughs> but I use it all the time. I, I use, I just browse it at work, you know, I'm just bored. Just yeah. go on well, and look at areas and see what's open. It's, it's pretty amazing how many new fought new spots and new places you can find to explore. Um, for thirty dollars, for sure. Oh, I I keep thinking of more questions. Where do you Perfect. get your satellite imagery, and how often is that updated? 
So actually, our current satellite imagery is actually Google imagery. Okay. Um, and we just got that imagery last year. Um, and so, like, we don't we don't have any control on how often they're updating. And, I see. And, and obviously, like, Google is constantly updating satellite imagery, but they're only able to constantly update so many locations at a time. Um, but we actually have some grander plans um, with satellite imagery that will hopefully be forthcoming. Very cool. Yeah. Well, do you want to share, uh, like, either where people can find OnX or, or just you if they want to follow along with what you're up to? Yeah, absolutely. Well, OnX, uh, we're on Instagram with OnX Hunt, uh, OnXMaps.com. And then I'm on Instagram, I'm Jared C. Larson. So feel free to give me a follow. Um, certainly do plenty of hunt and hunting and fishing. It's pretty much what I do outside of snowboarding. So, um, yeah, thanks for listening. And, and Katie, thanks for having me on. Yeah, thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. This was very insightful, and I'm excited to go check out all the features you mentioned. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's stay in touch, and uh, next time I'm in Colorado, we'll have to go hit the water. Sounds good. All right, and that's a wrap on episode number seven. As always, if you liked what you heard, go ahead and head over to the Wild Initiative podcast. You can subscribe there and get all my shows every Thursday, as well as all of Sam's other shows throughout the week. You can also find my episodes on the website, fishuntamed.com, in addition to weekly backcountry fly fishing articles. And you can find me on social media at Fish Untamed on Instagram or at Katie Burgert on Go Wild. I'll see you next week.